Welcome to Orchard Community Church. I'm so glad you're here today. If this video blesses you in any way, I want to ask you to do a couple things. One is I um, would love for you to share it with a friend or family member. Two, I'd love for you to go to www.orchardcc.org and make a financial contribution. That will help us to continue to get the gospel out, continue to get this truth out to people all around the world and all around our city and our nation. And then the third thing I want to ask you to do is um, consider becoming part of our church family. That means watching online regularly and participating um, with us in our weekly readings and all kinds of stuff. You can On our live page at, at orchardcc.org, you'll get our sermon notes and you can put together a group and, and figure out how to be together and be part of our church. I want to invite you to join us now. We'll get to our message. There's a lot to cover today, so I'm going to ask you to go to www.orchardcc.org, go to our live page, and on our live page there's a section called Sermon Notes, and if you click that, you can read through all of the passages and follow along. We're going to be in several passages, mainly in 2 Timothy chapter 3, but I'm going to also reference John 15, and I'm going to get into Matthew 6, and I'm going to be in 1 John, so lots to cover today. Today's our first day of looking at our series, First Things First, and in it we take a look at the whole year, what we want to focus on, and at Orchard, one of the things I want to focus on is our core values. We've traditionally had seven core values, and today's core values that we're going to look at are the Bible and prayer, and I want to start by understanding why God's Word and why prayer is so important to us here at Orchard. So we're going to look at Timothy, 2 Timothy specifically, and what we need to know about the book is Timothy was Paul's disciple, and, and he was living in Ephesus, and Paul's writing this letter to Timothy in Ephesus, and so we're going to look at chapter 3 and the first several verses in it. So here we are in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It reads like this. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of God godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with these people. So the problem in the world, why we need God's word, why we need prayer is, is really clear. One is evil teaching is on the way. So this passage is all about evil teaching and evil teachers that are infiltrating the church. Okay, And the assumption here is that Timothy wasn't able to stop these people. So then Paul writes this letter as a way to both encourage Timothy and also show him uh, the things he needs to focus on. So evil's increasing. It was increasing during Jesus' time. It's increasing during when Jesus died. Now, when Paul's here, it's increasing now with, uh, with us. So um, these evil people that the, the Bible is referring to is uh, types that would present themselves as teachers or leaders. So it's, it's a stretch from the text, but you could assume that these teachers would probably, probably be both in the religious and non-religious sector. Um, what's most troubling is that, is that the idea that this level of evil could and did at this time, infiltrate the church. It came inside the church. And so what we need to know, the point for us today is people are going to give themselves over to evil. Evil teaching is on the way. They will give themselves over to evil. This is the evidence of the last days. And as you can tell, there's this uh, here in the text, there's an assumption that the last days are going to come quickly. And what we know today is that it's been thousands of years since this text was written. And yet the days of evil are continuing to grow. So do you know um, that people call themselves Christian, but they will say things like, I, I don't like Christians. And when you meet people like this, they're trying to tell you and sell you something that's really important for you to catch. And that is that they're pushing their own agenda. These are the kinds of people Paul's talking about. And it's actually a very pervasive attitude in our world right now. We really see it in 2 Timothy 2, um, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, the second part, when it says, um, that's why he's saying, have nothing to do with these people. So, He's specifically indicating these people who are evildoers and putting themselves um, in positions of power and teaching in the church and in high places of, of spiritual leadership. That's the assumption. So Paul says, have nothing to do with them. So there you have it. The world's getting worse. People are behaving with evil and craziness in this world. And that's why we focus on God's word and the Bible. Okay, We have to pull it back. We got to understand um, how do we not become evil people? How do we live in a way that glorifies God? And so... Uh, Paul continues in, in verses 6 through 9. It says this. It says there, These are the kind of people who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Lots to unpack here. Evil people will oppose the truth is the point I want you to catch. So you have evil teaching coming into the world. Um, there's, there's evil people. And then these same evil people, these evil teachers, these people that are going to put themselves in high positions, these are the same evil people that are going to oppose the truth, okay? So those that oppose the truth will be also seeking to take advantage of people. And that's what we get from that passage in verse 6 when it talks about wanting to take control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins already. The assumption there is that there's already sin and and these people are going to take advantage of people who are, are already loaded down with sin and they're going to manipulate them in order to get them to go their way it's kind of like finding someone that you know is sinning and you're sinning in the same way and so you think oh well i'm just going to get them to join me in my sin and together we'll just be sinners together and no one will know about it and we'll kind of figure out our own way of interacting with God. And this is the line of thinking. This is the really, it's a perversion of, of God's truth because it strays away from the Bible. So evil teachings on the way, evil people will oppose the truth. Evil teachers will take advantage of people and the, the world is in a bad spot when it rejects Jesus and his teaching. So as followers of Christ, how do you deal with this? And at Orchard, we believe that the Bible teaches us who God is, what God wants us to do, what God wants us to know, how to know God, and what God wants for His children. And, and we really see that there's this invitation, not just to know God through the Bible, but to communicate to God through prayer. And this, this comes into focus when we look at what is it that God wants us to do? What, what does God want us to do as, as worshipers of Jesus? It really becomes clear in John 15, 7, and this is, um, this is in the, the um, it's called the Gethsemane Discourse, um, or the Vineyard Discourse in John 15. And we see it here in, in verse 7, 11. It says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The key to understanding these few verses is that you need to remain in Christ Jesus. So if you think, how do I live for Jesus? And why does the Bible and prayer, um, why is that important? Well, it's all about remaining in Christ. So the point here is we remain in Christ by knowing and obeying His word. So Jesus invites us to know Him and Jesus invites us to worship Him and Jesus invites us to follow Him. And that's wrapped up in this language of remain. Remain in me is what Jesus says. So if, if we want to avoid the craziness of evil teachers, people who give themselves over to evil, people who find themselves manipulating others, we need to remain in Christ. And Jesus makes it exceptionally clear by his teaching to his disciples that they can ask God for whatever they want if they remain in him. And the idea there is that when you remain in Christ, you're going to ask for the things that God wants. You're going to join God on his journey. So that means to know and love God truly is really to know his word, to know his commands, and then keep his commands. Not live however you want, not do whatever you want, not seek whatever you want, or make Christianity fit your own personal needs. Really without God's word, without God's instruction, or, or God's teaching, um, how can you follow God? You, you can't. Um, how do you remain in Him? You, you, you can't. You need God's Word, and you need the Holy Spirit, and you need to know God, and that happens through reading His Word and talking to Him. So the problem, again, to make clearly, is evil people will bring evil teaching, and those people will manipulate and, and give themselves over to evil. And the Christian solution is to oh, remain in Christ and obey God's commands. And so this is one of the reasons Jesus invites his disciples to pray, and we see that imitation in Matthew 6. Let's see in verses 9 through 13. It says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All right, lots to study here, but for today I want to highlight Orchard's value of prayer. So, the idea again here, we have a core value here at Orchard to look at the Bible, go to the Bible, learn from God, and then pray, talk to God, communicate with God. And so 
All of it is designed so that we might remain in Christ and then avoid becoming evildoers and evil teachers and, and manipulators. Okay, we don't want to do that. What we want to do is remain in Christ and follow Him. So Jesus invites us to pray, and we see that in, clearly in Matthew 6. And uh, this passage is so amazing because Jesus is literally inviting us into a relationship with Himself. And I just want you to take a moment and imagine how big that is, that the God of the universe, um, the, the one who created everything, is inviting you and me into a relationship with him, and he is the Savior. So the reason he says, if you remain in me, you can ask for whatever you want, is because when you remain in God himself, you're giving up, um, you're sacrificing all of the desires of your own flesh and, and participating in the goodness that God has to offer by his cleansing power that he gives us through his spirit, um, by the sacrifice of his son. And then, then you ask for things that end up aligning with God's heart. So Jesus invites us to pray and the Bible tells us something happens when we pray. And, and, and that is seen in 1 John four, uh, chapter 5, verse 14, 15. It says this, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. So what's amazing is the idea that God, the God of the universe, he invites us to pray. And not only does he invite us to pray, but the point here, God hears our prayers. The English reads, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. Where, whereas the Greek reads, and it better translate, it's better translated maybe in the presence of God. So the idea is Jesus invites us to pray and the scriptures t telling us that we can have confidence in approaching the presence of God. That means standing in the presence of God when we pray. Now, when we do that, we develop this incredible relationship with God, and that's the point. You remain in Christ, in God, when you are talking to God and approaching God with your prayer and, and knowing that you're in the presence of God. That's how we remain, by knowing Him. We know God's Word, we know God's voice, and we, we're able to talk to Him and, and listen to Him and, and realize that He listens to us. And the Bible teaches us that we can have great confidence in that in that presence, and because God hears our prayers. So the context uh, for that verse is, 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 is found in verses 1 through 2 of 1 John 5. And, it, and verses 1 through 2 say, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his ch child as well. So this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out God, His commands. Believing Jesus is the Christ, born of God, loving God, loving God's Son, knowing God, all, all of this is expressed in carrying out His commands. So where do you find these commands? You find them in God's Word, and that is the Bible. So let's go back to 2 Timothy 3 now, and you can see it right there in front of you. It says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured? Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Some key things to see here is uh, that Timothy is clearly a disciple of Paul. That's why he says, uh, you, however, know about all my teaching, my way of life. So we, we know also in this passage that discipleship is critically important. But the point that I want you to catch is persecution and salvation will occur. Both of those will occur. They occurred with Paul. They occurred with Paul, the disciples of Jesus. And so they're going to occur with us too. And what's very interesting to pay attention to is that both of these are happening. Verse 11 and 12 teach us that though we, that though we can remain in Christ, it doesn't mean our lives are going to be easy. Church, I wanted to go through this passage just to remind you that even though you have a secure relationship with God, you're going to go through difficulty still. Persecution is going to come in different ways. Now, I would like to define persecution by things that maybe are difficult in my life, but that is actually not true. That would be false teaching. The persecution from the context that Paul's giving us here is not just difficulty in my life. Persecution is difficulty at, that results from my preaching and declaring of the gospel. So it's challenges that are associated with being Christian uniquely. They, they are going to happen to you. People are going to criticize you. Your family's going to give you a hard time or, or coworkers or, 
or different people in your lives. And our job is to remain faithful through the persecutions and remember that God's going to bring salvation. So knowing God is remaining in Christ. Remaining in Christ will require full engagement from you. And I want to encourage you to live your life with full engagement with God um, because he's the God of the universe. He's invited you to talk to him, to be in his presence, and you can find security in it, even though you might experience persecution. Um, you will experience salvation as well. And Paul continues to encourage Timothy in verse 14. And it says here, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So how do we learn about God? All right, we go to the Bible to know about God because the Bible is our discipleship text. The Bible is how we learn from God. That's what it tells us. And Paul challenges Timothy to continue what he's learned from Paul and also to continue to look at the Scripture because it's filled with God's breath. Um, we have to remember that the beginning of this section is a reference to these evil teachers, evil teaching, people coming in to, to uh, take advantage of people that are already laden down with sin. And those who are bringing evil, um, their aim is not to glorify God, but to be manipulators. And Paul's encouraging Timothy to remember what he's learned from himself, from Paul, but also from the scriptures and what the scriptures teach. Verse 15 says, he knows the holy scriptures, which makes you wise for salvation. And then we get a famous passage, which if you don't know, would be really good to memorize. And that's 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. And that's the all scriptures God breathed one. Another way to translate this whole scripture passage, though, would be to say that the word of God is full of God and will help you remain in Christ and will help you learn and correct others and train people on how to follow God, all for the purpose of being ready to do every good work God has for you because it's all about remaining in God. So why do we focus on the Bible and prayer? It's because we want to remain in Christ. And the primary way you remain in Christ is you have to know Christ. You have to know God. And the main way that God's given himself to us is twofold. One is the Holy Spirit, and two is God's Word, the Bible. So you communicate with the Holy Spirit through prayer, and you communicate to God, the Father, the Trinity, through prayer, through coming into the presence of God. And we learn about the character, the nature, and the, the mission of God all through his Word. And that's your message for today. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us.